here on <clears throat> case number 659324, State of Ohio versus Jared Bell. Defendant is appearing by Zoom. Present in the courtroom are his attorneys, Ian Friedman and Madeline Grant. Present from the State of Ohio is Kevin Bringman. We're here for sentencing. The defendant having pled to one count of attempted endangering children, felony of the fourth degree, and one count of disseminating matter harmful to juveniles, a misdemeanor of the first degree. Uh, on behalf of the uh, state, Mr. Bringman, do you wish to address the court? Great. Got you. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court. Uh, the victim in this case uh, is present today. Okay, Mr. Bell here. Mr. Bell, can you hear the prosecutor? You asked him to come here. Yeah, I'm going to ask him. Dre, can you hear the prosecutor from the podium? Yes. Again, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the victim. Uh, uh, is present today via Zoom. It's my understanding that she has prepared uh, some statements for the court. Uh, and importantly, those statements um, will concern the defendant's conduct, um, but specifically and most importantly, the harm caused uh, and that she has suffered uh, as a result of his actions. Uh, Your Honor, what I can tell you at this point is that um, the victim in this case has been severely impacted and harmed uh, by this defendant, his actions, uh, a man uh, and someone that she idolized and looked up to uh, for years. Uh, Your Honor, what we are asking, the state of Ohio is asking today is that you listen to her, take her statements uh, into consideration when you uh, order your sentence. Um, as she talks to you about uh, this defendant, his actions, uh, and the harm caused uh, and impose a fair, just, uh, and appropriate sentence uh, that does not demean uh, his conduct or uh, the seriousness um, or the harm caused uh, to the victim. And I believe uh, the victim at this point uh, has prepared some statements, so I would uh, ask the court to direct their attention to uh, the victim. Uh, Ma'am, this is uh, Judge McCormick. Uh, do you wish to address the court and the defendant in this matter? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to read my statement to you. I chose to write the statement. Sorry? Let me interrupt for a second. I'm going to ask okay. that you not show her picture, please. She's a minor. Oh, but no, no. go ahead, ma'am. I chose to write the statement because I want justice to be served more than anything. The only time that the defendant has appeared in court in person was on June 3rd for his arraignment, which was before the media found out about this case. He has appeared in court today over Zoom instead of appearing in person. This doesn't surprise me and shows what a coward he is, but I am not a coward. And that is why I'm going to reveal all of the details of the crimes that he committed against me. Aside from Cleveland, the only other time that the defendant sexually assaulted me was in October of 2017. It happened in Illinois in the middle of the night. He digitally penetrated me in the back seat of my aunt's car while she was driving him to a friend's house. The Illinois police only agreed to move forward with that case if the Ohio police did not pursue this case. I don't understand why, regardless of their reasons why, he has gotten away with sexually assaulting me in Illinois. So today, I will be discussing the details of the crimes that he has pleaded guilty to and the impact that they have had on me. But before I do that, I would like to provide you with some context on my relationship with the defendant and what led up to these crimes. 
This portion of my statement explains how he started grooming me when I was 12 years old. I started off as a fan of him. I was definitely one of his biggest fans. Everyone who knew me as a child knew that he was a hero to me. I would have done anything for him. When I was 11, I learned that my aunt had a mutual friend who knew the defendant. That led to my aunt taking me to meet him for the first time in 2014 when I was 12. I adored him and he instantly made me feel that he adored me right back. From the time I was 12 to 15, my aunt took me to meet him and spend time with him many times. After I met him for the first time, he started speaking to me more frequently online. I confided in him about very personal things about myself, including my struggle with my mental health. I went to him for advice and for someone to lean on, and he gave me that. I felt protected and loved by him. When I was 13, I went to him for boy advice. He told me that I was beautiful and that boys were stupid. He then sent me a photo of myself that he had screen capped from my Instagram, telling me that I was, quote, such a cutie. I took and uploaded that photo online a year earlier when I was 12 years old. He saved that photo of me onto his phone. I didn't realize how disturbing that was until many years later. Another instance of creepy behavior happened when I was spending time with him at the age of 14. He told me that he couldn't believe how much I'd grown since he last saw me. He said that I wasn't little anymore and I was quote, a woman now. When I was 15, I noticed a huge shift regarding his treatment and attitude towards me. When I was younger, he was sweet and actually wanted to talk to me about my life. But at 15, he started sending me messages about how, quote, hot I was. In the summer of 2017, I messaged him, telling him that I was going to see him in concert in the following months. He replied by telling me that he couldn't wait to see me. He also asked me, quote, how old are you now? I told him 15. He then told me to, quote, hurry up, don't smile at me. Not too long after that, his messages to me became blatantly sexual. This eventually led to many months of inappropriate messages and photos being exchanged over Instagram and Snapchat. The photos exchanged included photos of my body and photos of his body and his genitals. In the beginning, I was excited. I thought that he really liked me and I thought that I meant something to him, but that didn't last. Back then, the last thing I wanted was to lose him, not only because I was completely infatuated with him, but because I became scared of him. There were times where I felt really uncomfortable talking to him in such graphic sexual ways and wanted to be left alone. But I had a very hard time telling him that because I was terrified of upsetting him, so I would make excuses. When I did, quote, upset him, he made me cry. If I didn't give him what he wanted, he was spiteful. It made me feel guilty. He made me feel disgusting and absolutely awful about myself. At that point, it was clear that he was the one who was in control. I felt trapped and stuck because I still idolized him. He had me wrapped around his finger. This caused a tremendous amount of stress and shame crimes that he committed against me in Cleveland, I want to make something very clear. The reason that these particular incidents did not result any further than oral sex was because the defendant knew that I was menstruating at the time. Had I not been menstruating then, he would have raped me. Don't look at me like that. Because he would tell me how badly he wanted to penetrate me vaginally, but use much more vulgar language. On December 1st, 2017, my aunt took me to the Odeon Concert Club to watch him perform. That night, the defendant took me backstage to be alone with him. He started kissing me and the night ended and him having me perform oral sex on him twice. The next incident happened on December 2nd, 2017, while I was alone with him in his hotel room. He had talked to me about seeing me one last time before we all left Cleveland and went home. So we went to his hotel to say goodbye. 
in his hotel room. He started kissing me and had me perform oral sex on him again. My aunt was right outside the room waiting in the hallway while this was happening. She trusted him and never thought that he would ever do anything to hurt me. Now, I would like to bring up an individual who has known about these crimes for years. This person is the defendant's partner, Janet Vaughn. In January of 2018, I was engaging in an inappropriate conversation with who I thought was the defendant until I received a message back from the defendant's account claiming to be Janet. That was the first interaction I ever had with her. This confused and devastated me. And I begged the defendant for an explanation about that exchange with her. He brushed it off by repeatedly claiming that everything was fine. After these crimes happened, I tried to shake off all of the gross feelings that I had. Ignoring those feelings only made them worse. I felt so miserable, broken, and humiliated. I was struggling to sleep every night. The sexual messages continued for a while after that until I eventually put a stop to them. I did that by confronting him about what he had done to me. I confronted him in September of 2018, just weeks before I had reported the Illinois and Ohio crimes to my local police. I chose to confront him about what he had done to me because I wanted to gain my power back. I had to suck up all of the fear that I felt in order to confront him. He ignored me for many days at first. Eventually, he tried apologizing to me for, quote, breaking my heart, but deleted those messages quickly afterward. His crimes are not heartbreaking or whatever other loose ter term he uses. They are disgusting. He didn't care then and he doesn't care now. That makes me feel worthless. I confronted Janet as well. When I confronted her, she claimed that she didn't know anything about these crimes. She denied speaking with me in January of 2018 and claimed that wasn't her. She told me that none of this was my fault and apologized to me. She also told me that she wanted to quote, jump in front of a car. However, at one point she asked me to let her know when I was going to the police with this case for her own benefit. Of course, I did not do that. She knows what happened and she doesn't care. Janet is just one of the few people who have tried to protect him and the others will now know exactly who they are. The pain that the defendant has caused me is indescribable and it worsens every day. Being used by somebody who meant the world to me has left me feeling more hurt than I've ever been before. I am now 19 and my life hasn't been the same since I was 15. I think about these crimes every single day. I feel like I'm in a constant dark place. Sometimes I wish I could disappear so I can forget about what happened. Right after I reported him, my parents sent me to a therapist. So far, they have spent $7,620 in hopes that she can help me move forward from this. These crimes have especially impacted my relationship with my aunt. For a while, I could not fathom how my aunt had no idea what was going on, and that made me doubt the trust that I had in her. To this day, there is still tension and awkwardness between her and myself. Every time I speak to her and look at her, I think about the defendant and what he did to me. My relationship with my aunt will never be the same, and that breaks my heart. My whole family is hurting because I am hurting. Their trust in my aunt has been affected too. My aunt blames herself for leaving me alone with the defendant. My parents blame themselves for placing their trust in my aunt to protect me and keep me safe. It's awful to hear them say that. Every night I dread going to sleep because I don't wanna see him in my nightmares. I have lost many nights of sleep because of this. I've lost count over how many times I fell asleep in class when I was in high school due to so many sleepless nights. I also occasionally had to leave school early due to having panic attacks that were triggered by these incidents. During these panic attacks, I would struggle to breathe, sweat, shake, cry, and often faint. When I do sleep and do see in my nightmares, it throws off my entire day. I'm sorry.
these crimes have affected my dating life as well. Every day I have since gone on has ended with me going home crying. Every time I feel the slightest bit vulnerable around a guy, all I can think of and see is the defendant. I have serious trust issues because of him. Dating your teenagers should be a fun experience and should not be something that brings up trauma caused by a grown man. The defendant's crimes against me are the worst things that he could have ever done to me. He was such a huge part of my childhood and in return, he ruined my life. Back when I confronted him, he told me that he didn't want me to hate him. I don't hate him, I loathe him. <sighs> now I would like to ask you something important. Whether a person has a lot of influence, some or none at all, these are crimes that are unforgivable and inexcusable. They can never be taken back. He was calculating, he preyed on me and sexually abused me. He is a monster and a danger to children. I am kindly asking you to send a powerful message that these crimes are never okay, no matter who a person is. I also want to bring up the letter that I wrote to you. In my letter, I explain why the defendant is not remorseful for his crimes. I described how he has publicly found humor in them and how he has used tactics to gain sympathy from the public. He could have easily ignored the people online who were mocking this case. Instead, he went out of his way to let them know that he thinks it's funny and he can give me that look all he wants. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. <sighs> The crimes that he committed against me are some kind of sick joke to him. My suffering is not for him to laugh at or his leverage to brag about becoming a good man now that he is a father. So today, if the defendant tries to tell you that he is remorseful, I am asking you to appreciate that actions speak louder than words. Since his arraignment and plea hearing, his actions have been loud and clear and they have shown that he simply does not care and does not have an ounce of remorse. I won't be surprised if he tries to manipulate everybody into believing that he's changed, but he can't fool me. If he is truly sorry for anything, he is sorry that he has finally been caught. I can assure you of that. He committed these crimes against me with pride. A defendant who clearly feels no remorse for his crimes deserves to be given the maximum sentence possible. I will never forget what he did to me. I idolized and looked up to him, and he took that and broke it in the most sickening way possible. He is the epitome of evil. I deserved better than to be used for his sick desires and for my suffering to be used for his amusement. Jared Drake Bell is a pedophile, and that is his legacy. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Anything further on behalf of the state? On behalf of the defense.
this case, it was okay if you show her face. Because they want to see her reaction to his statements. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Our first... Before I really get into the sentencing, I would like to uh, recognize and acknowledge uh, the professionalism uh, that was shown by uh, my colleague, Kevin Bringman, and uh, his supervisor, Jennifer Driscoll, uh, in allowing us to really process this case over a long period of time. While the case seems that it went so quickly uh, from arraignment to plea to sentencing, it's because the work was done on the front, and I do appreciate uh, their uh, working with us to effectuate that. You know. There's no question that uh, Drake has uh, accepted his responsibility in this case by the way of his plea. Uh, he has pled to the felony of the fourth degree, attempted child endangerment, and a misdemeanor uh, disseminating, neither of which uh, require any sexual registration. The chat that was referred to by Prosecutor Bringman was the dissemination, uh, and that did create a risk of harm uh, to then minor, uh, now uh, adult, and I think we're just going by initials, uh, SG, uh, in this case. Um, if not, it doesn't matter if the names, do you want a victim or SG? It doesn't matter, but I'll leave it to you. Victim? All right. For, uh, prosecutors asked that I just refer uh, to this person as victim, so I will do that for purposes of this hearing. You know, there have been a lot of uh, claims that were made uh, by the victim. Uh, here and uh, it's not often or can I even recall an instance where defense counsel at sentencing had to address the credibility of the victim's allegations at sentencing but this appears to be that time um, I will simply say this some of these claims that were made about sending photos of genitals we went through these claims uh, with the prosecutor's office for a long time, uh, approximately 18 months, no such uh, uh, image uh, was presented, uh, either to the state or to the defense. The claim that he is a pedophile um, lacks any sort of factual support uh, from the case, and it also lacks any sort of mental health claim. It's an easy uh, uh, tag to give someone, uh, but doesn't fit in this case clearly uh, uh, the victim in this case, uh, and again, it, it's difficult because it's hard for me to walk the very fine line in this case between what he did and what he's being accused of doing, that which he accepted responsibility for and that which he would never accept responsibility for. Well, I'm going to ask Please. you, what does he accept responsibility for? So the acceptance of the responsibility, Your Honor, uh, is for chats that occurred between he and the victim. The subject matter of those chats were um, going, well, there was a lot to it. So there was discussion because they had known each other for years and there were claims that became sexual in nature. When asked, however, uh, at what point, uh, or at your age, excuse me, uh, at that point he said, can you hurry up? Which shows a complete intent not to engage uh, with a minor. So, however, those chats, harmful as they were, clearly harmed this person uh, at that time. They were sexual in nature. Those were, yes. Thank you. They certainly, however, Your Honor, did not mimic any of the factual scenarios that the victim has brought up here today. Uh, and again, I have to emphasize the fact that once the age was known, uh, that terminated at that point, saying hurry up uh, with the age. But I will say this. Let me ask you this. Yes, please. She was when he first started engaging in conversations with her either at a concert or by telephone. He didn't know that her age. At the start, he may not have known. He did learn of the age at a later time, Your Honor, and that is why he's accepting the plea. What's it? Yeah, during the chats, Your Honor. Kevin, you have the dates on the chat? The chats, correct? You would agree? So the state and defense would agree the age was mentioned during those chats, Your Honor. All right. So, Your Honor, other than, uh, you know, this, this offense for which he's pled guilty, uh, this court is aware that there were uh, two uh, OVIs, but nothing ever similar uh, to anything like this. 
uh, we would ask for uh, basic community controlled sanction, uh, which would be, then be transferred to uh, California. Um, that certainly would be sufficient pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 29, 29, 11, 12, 13, and 14, because in this case, recidivism does not appear likely, and nor does the severity of it uh, outweigh any similar offenses by similar offenders uh, when we're looking at the what was actually pled to in this case. Uh, the claim that seeing the therapist uh, resulted from this, and again, this is where I'm just going to take this uh, responsibility for making the record straight. I'm sure it's not going to be um, the victim in this case is not going to like what I have to say, but we are aware that that therapy did not begin uh, with Drake. This began before. Um, throughout this case, and this is why I think that the plea is very accurate and very fitting, and all parties agreed to this, uh, including the victim in this case, was aware of this before this day uh, and approved of this plea. Uh, clearly, she, uh, according to a lot of the statements that were provided in this case, worshipped uh, and kind of held herself out as a super fan of Mr. Bell. There were no claims at all of any sort of inappropriate conduct until the victim in this case learned of Mr. Bell's fiance, now wife. And at that point, that's when everything kind of um, turned the world upside down. In going through all of these uh, statements and all the witnesses in this case, I will just simply, I'm trying to do this in as gentle a manner as possible, um, but there was certainly concern uh, for um, the victim's reality uh, in her case and in her claims thereafter. The claims as to uh, Janet Bell and the exchange online that was happening. We had provided a video to the prosecutor's office uh, from Ms. Bell. Uh, she explained why she spoke to the victim the way that she did. Uh, she explained that she was just trying to appease her and trying to um, let her believe that she was just being heard because she had difficulty even talking to her about it. So this was not anything that as the victim somehow believes now was genuine by uh, Ms. Bell, this was an attempt just simply to diffuse the situation, which in hindsight, they clearly judged correctly as a dangerous situation. I'm not sitting here today, Judge, to minimize uh, the conduct of what Drake did. But what was accused here today, what was brought out here today was a far other world from what we, the state and the defense, uh, had contemplated prior to. Since the time of her allegation, when she claims that this happened, she went to nine additional concerts uh, that he was at. She would message him saying, I miss you. Um, you know, when we talk about the, the kind of different uh, reality, I think one of the points that stood out most to me uh, was in the victim's um, videoed statement to uh, the detective in this case from the Cleveland Police Department at Tanasio. When he asked her, has anyone come to speak to you on behalf of the defense? And she said, yes. And uh, the detective said, who was that? Well, they're the private investigator for uh, Mr. Bell. And we were, the prosecution, defense, were all in the same room. We heard that. And we knew perfectly well that that had never happened. Uh, and then all of a sudden she uh, stated that, oh, you know what? Actually, I was wrong. I was confused. It didn't happen. I just, it was, uh, it was just seemed really realistic to me. And that showed great concern for credibility and recollection. She talks about the hotel room uh, at the A-Loft, and I understand that she has problems with her aunt now, but it is important to show that there was another adult who was there. All of this was shared with the state and the defense. This is why we pled the way that we did uh, to what was actually done, not what is actually being stated here today. And that friend was very clear, not just in a statement to the defense, but also in another recorded statement to uh, the Cleveland Police uh, Detective Antanasio, uh, and that person stated uh, that the victim had never gone into uh, Mr. Bell's room alone, period. And that was twice stated uh, to us and to the detective. She talks about performing oral sex here today on two occasions, stating that you know, there was never that this happened in the back room at the Odeon. We also were able to identify and share uh, witnesses who indicated they had gone back and forth uh, down the hall into that room throughout the night. The door was open. There were people in that room at all night, at all times, uh, and this did not happen. 
um, she did tell one of her friends, and I'll, I'll get to some here in a moment, uh, that she did report this uh, when she did because uh, she did not, um, or she said that Mr. Bell did not respond to her liking. So in essence, what this is was a person who, and that's okay, idolized this person. His conduct was not correct. It was not proper uh, for what he did. Uh, and unfortunately, he did not know um, who he was speaking with and the damage that this was going to do. But I have to be very clear uh, because it would not be fair to sit there and uh, just accept everything that was said. What occurred or what the victim is claiming to have occurred here, not only am I saying that it did not happen, not only would Mr. Bell say that that did not happen, but the evidence in the state, uh, the evidence in this case would suggest it did not happen. And again, we all know that this prosecutor's office would pursue child sex charges and go to great lengths and aggressively as they should. And we've seen it many times if they felt that that was a provable case, I'm sure we would not be talking here today about an attempted child endangerment and a disseminating uh, matter harmful uh, to a minor. Now, as far as sanction, Your Honor, and asking for the basic community control sanction, I would submit that there's already a great penalty that has been paid uh, by Mr. Bell uh, that others would not face merely because of his position. Uh, as, as the court knows, uh, online, if you just simply type in his name, uh, the initial Google result will come up with uh, 23.6 million uh, results that deal with uh, Drake Bell and this very process for which we're standing here today. So this is something that's going to tag him and follow him around. He's already seen a loss of uh, uh, employment uh, because of this, because people have wondered, what is this all about? Uh, my hope is that that will start up for him again when now they know what the reality of this actually is. Um, you know, again, to go back to the just flip and claim that he's a pedophile, um, as the court is aware, uh, we did uh, engage professionals in this, and there is no such finding um, as was suggested here today. So, Your Honor, I would submit that the basic community control sanction with the interstate compact of California uh, is adequate. Lack of history justifies what we are, are requesting. The nature of the plea, the level of the offenses certainly supports that request as well. And if it would please the court, I would ask that Mr. Bell uh, make a brief statement on his own behalf. And I would also okay. um, let the court know that I've asked Mr. Bell to keep it brief because in my professional judgment, I cannot state that uh, civil litigation will not follow this. And I feel that I would not be doing uh, a service to my client uh, if, uh, if I didn't uh, suggest that. Now, yes, of course, there was a plea that can be used, but we're still talking about two very different things here today. So I thank the court uh, for consideration. Thank you, counsel. Um, with respect to the potential civil, civil litigation, he has pled to uh, certain offenses which could expose him to civil uh, liability. So in that regard, I would like to hear from the defendant uh, as to what his position on this is and why this occurred. Mr. Bell, go ahead. Um. Your Honor, I, I just want to say today that I accept this plea because my conduct was wrong. Um, I'm sorry that the victim was harmed in any way, but that was obviously not my intention. Um, I have taken this matter very, very seriously. Um, and again, I just want to apologize to her and, and um, anyone else who may have been affected by my actions. Uh, anything further? No, Your Honor. Very good. Um, well, the court heard a lot of serious and disturbing uh, allegations here today, but uh, I can't lose uh, focus on the fact as to what he pled to. He did not plead to sexual misconduct or engaging in sexual 
relations. He pled to endangering, attempted endangering children and disseminating matter harmful to juveniles. These are serious allegations, but they do not involve sexual relations. Um, however, a grown man does not engage in inappropriate text messages to a teenager. There's a reason why a 14 or 15 year old does not have the right to drive, does not have the right to vote, does not have the right to serve in the armed forces. They don't have the emotional or mental maturity to properly gauge their conduct. So you did take advantage in that regard to somebody who could not appreciate the consequences of the relationship or lack of relationship or inappropriate relationship. Now, I respect your attorney and he talks about that your position has exacerbated the, the harm that befallen you uh, because of all this uh, publicity. But the fact of the matter is your position in celebrity status enabled you to nurture this relationship. You were able to gain access to this child and you were able to gain the trust of this child. So it's a two-edged sword, your position. I, I hope you truly are remorseful. I don't know. Um, you are going to get uh, one year on the uh, felony four, six months on the uh, misdemeanor. They'll run concurrent by operation of law. I will suspend the imposition of the sentence. You will be uh, subject to two years community control sanctions. Um, you'll have to register with Cuyahoga County. They will facilitate the transfer of probation to uh, California. They will uh, evaluate your... Um, a sexual offender uh, report that was submitted under seal. They will determine whether you have to undergo additional counseling. You will also uh, perform 200 hours of uh, community work service and you are to have no contact with the victim, court costs imposed. Anything further, counsel? No, you're right. Very good. Thank you.